Hello and welcome back everyone to this week's episode of Tea Time and Time Travel, where every week we take our time machine, the Time Warp, and go back in time to interview some of history's most influential people over a cup of tea. This week, as part of our Financial Frenzy Month, we will be visiting Jean-Baptiste Say, a classical liberal economist who lived during the mid-18th century. Say is best known for Say's Law, but let's let him speak for himself. That was a quick trick. Okay, the year is 1805 two years after Say published his treatise on political economy. I will summon him here now using my time warp machine so that we can hear more about his life and his beliefs. Let's go. Ah, oh, sacre bleu, who are you? What is that? Bonjour, Monsieur Say. My name is Noreen and I am here from the future to interview you and get a first person account of your life and your economic policies. The future, you say, eh? Malthus told me you fools visited him last week. I guess I should have known. Well, since you brought tea, I guess I don't have a choice. What That's would you true. like to hear? Well, to begin with, when and where were you born, and how did you choose to become an economist? Well, to begin with, I am not only an economist, but I'll get into that later. I was born in Lyon, France in 1767 to a family of textile merchants. I grew up moving between many places in Europe, including Geneva and London. Mm -hmm. In 1785, I went to Croydon School in South London, where I finished college alongside my brother. Then I was hired by many merchants and did many apprenticeships, most notably under Etienne Clavier, the finance minister during the French Revolution. Under Clavier, I truly began to grow and thrive. Hmm. Under his liege, I started publishing a periodical called Le Décade Philosophique, Littéraire et Politique, in which I praise, but also criticize and show what is wrong with many economists' theories, okay. including those of Adam Smith. Um, so, what about your time as part of the Tribunal in France? Don't get me started on the Tribunal. Those whack, excuse my French, politicians tried to demote me to some lower position and pay me more as if I would never say anything. But since I strongly di disagreed with many of the Napoleon administration's policies and I'm the bigger man, I decided to just resign. Afterward, I returned to my roots, opening several cotton mills around Europe, and I hired pretty much only women and children to be my labor force and further my cause okay. of cotton. So the stuff about the cotton mills is really interesting, but what our viewers would most like to hear about Problem. are your economic beliefs. In fact, we have received like 4,000 tweets from Twitter um, about your economic beliefs specifically. What in the baguette is a tweeter? Anyway, ask away. So, one of our tweets was, what are your thoughts on laissez-faire economics as described by Adam Smith? Um, Adam Smith is a very interesting economist who I base many of my theories off of. I'm considered by others to be a proponent of classical liberal economics, which means I strongly favor economic freedom and, em and an emphasis on laissez-faire or hands-off economics. I do agree with many of the things that Adam Smith has stated, including his view that an unbalanced market in terms of production will naturally return to balance without government intervention. However, ugh, I strongly disagree with his views that the value of a commodity is dependent on the labor involved in its production. So wrong. Instead, I have revised this con concept and made it so much better. And I believe that the commodity gains its value from its ability to please or meet the needs of its consumer. I'm sure this theory has been adopted by many. Ah, yes. In fact, you were one of the first economists to state this theory about labor and form your theories based on this. Was this part of your um, treatise of political economy? Oh, wow. My measly little book is known even in the future. That's very nice to know. Um, but yeah, in my treatise, I combine and modify the economic beliefs of Adam Smith and Etienne Bonneau de Condillac, as well as many other economists. <clears throat> I also have made sure to include some of my own original theories, just to make sure I'm not completely plagiarizing. That is very interesting. Also, for your information, your treatise on political economy has gained much recognition throughout Europe <coughs> and even influenced the economic beliefs of the Founding Fathers That's of the cool. United States. This book was very important for popularizing and making accessible Adam Smith's economic beliefs, as well as some of your own, and many others. Not to toot your horn, but a modern author has stated that with pen and ink, Smith, Smith made the entrepreneur invisible. J.B. Say brings him back to center stage. Now, the thing you were most popular 
um, and known for Say's is law. Say's Law. Would you like to sure. explain that law? So Say's Law, or um, also known as the theory of markets, states that the aggregate production is the source of its own aggregate demand. When somebody produces a good or service, they get paid for that work. And in turn, they're able to use the money that they get from pr providing that good or service um, to demand other goods and services. In other words, you, or in layman's terms, you cannot buy something without having something to sell. Ah, I see. Mm -hmm. Your theory was very frequently restated and revised by modern economists. And the theory is in, even used to an extent by Austrian economists um, today, or rather in the future, I guess. They use your law, as well as your treatise of political economy, to assist in their understanding of markets and prices. John Maynard Keynes very famously summarized this theory um, by saying, mm -hmm. supply creates its own demand, which many believe is not entirely accurate. Would you care to comment on in what situation this theory would hold true? Sure. So, I do see that my theory can be kind of rigid. It equates aggregate supply and aggregate demand, but that's never the case in real life because people often make decisions that are not necessarily what you would expect, especially during times of recession and when people fear losing money. Um, and aggregate demand is not necessarily always equal to aggregate demand. In my opinion, this theory only holds up if we lived in a world without political involvement in the economy, which mm -hmm. is the way things should be, but alas, they are not. Okay. So. Throughout history, your theories and publications have influenced many economists, such as Va mm -hmm. uh, Ludwig von Mises and Fr Friedrich Hayek. Related to people we have influenced, we have related, received many questions on your thoughts on other economic thinkers during your time, mm -hmm. such as David Ricardo or Thomas M. Uh, yeah. Thomas Malthus. So, one of the other major so bodies of work I have published um, was my letters to Mr. Malthus and the Catechism of the Political Economy, mm -hmm. also known as just the letters to Mr. Malthus. Um, in these letters, I explained to Malthus um, how economic growth can occur without um, destabilizing economic mm -hmm. forces. I also just revised some of his other theories. As for the other economists, I have scheduled many public debates with um, tons of economists, including David Ricardo, which I'll totally win because I'm the better economist. I think basically I'm a policy-oriented economic thinker rather than someone okay. who just draws up models all day like <laughs> Ricardo. I certainly know about those debates. Um, so one final question. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling? Has the space-time continuum just ripped your atoms apart? I don't know what that means or mm -hmm. what those are, um, but I certainly hope not. That doesn't sound fun. Merci beaucoup mm -hmm. for your question. No problem. Thank you. Thank you Travel for your contributions, Mr. Say. Um, goodbye. Got a time. Whew, what a very interesting man. Now, although he provided us with plenty of insight into his very cool, amazing life, there are many things that happened after that interview, after 1805. Here's a rapid-fire list of some fun facts about Jean-Baptiste Say. So, Say served as the chair of political economy at the Conservatoire de, des Arts et Métiers, which was a doctoral degree-granting program run by the French government, um, and was used to promote studies in science and industry. Then, afterwards, he was sent by the French government to um, England to study the British economy um, during the time of the American Revolution and gather information on their economic situations. As he grew older, he became friends with David Ricardo and Thomas Malthus, and even though he frequently debated um, and contested their ideas, they still remained friends um, as they aged. Um, so, Jean-Baptiste Say lived during a very interesting time, um, seeing as the Re American Revolution, the French Revolution, um, the Napoleonic Wars, as well as the, um, uh, or the rise of the Bourbon monarchy was all during his lifetime. And finally, Jean-Baptiste Say died on November 15th, 1832. Very interesting man. So, if you like this episode, be sure to subscribe and leave a comment for who you want to see next week. Thank you!